here's a good question from um, Martin Swinburne. And when you want to say good, is it like a good one, like a proper one? Or? No, 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 this, this guy's a nice guy, he, uh, very polite, um, very concerned about your health. Ah. Um, heard about the, the injury, the accident. So it's not a life living member then. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, the question I want to ask is, how close were you to, to Paul Delette? And could you please shine some light on not only the Im infamous cramping debacle, mm -hmm. but also why the hell Paul couldn't hold a pose to save his life? And what was going on with Paul in the battle for the Olympia 96-97 DVD, where it appears that he can barely talk? So you got three, three, I think that three uh, parts, the cramping debacle. Well, Paul was, I think I'm really good at Paul, because like I said, when Paul left his wife, he had stayed with me for eight months, leading up to the 98 Olympia, so Paul lived with me for eight months, and we got on great, and Paul is posing, you know, when it came to his back shots, I don't know, people always wondered why he never saw the Paul de Lat spread out or do the redouble bicep, it just seemed to never come out like properly where we're just going to control the muscles but every other pose you look great in but the rear lat spread a rear double bicep just never seemed to you know come out properly and then the diuretic thing like two weeks before that show a week before it golds Paul was like super dry super shredded and come the day of the show he thought he wanted to be a bit harder so he took a 40 milligram injectable Lasix and on stage he went to do a rear lat spread pose and locked up like a ironing board and had to carry him off like an ironing board. They grabbed his arms and legs and just carried him off stage, but that almost killed him there, just from the Lasix, just took everything out of him. His body cramped from head to toe. So that was pretty bad. Like he almost died doing that. So that was, wasn't too good for Paul that time. So and what was the other part you wanted to know? Um, and, um, and what was the um, going on with Paul in the battle for uh, the... Yeah, no, he's always he's had like a bit of asthma for that's why you know, a lot of times when he's talking he'll <gasps> sort of be like <gasps> wheezing like that so that's only due to like a bit of an asthma problem not that he was dying or anything like that but and a lot of times too it's like you know when you've interviewed me here when you're training sometimes when they do the interviews they'll interview you after you've done your set so generally you're sort of out of breath anyway and then if you've got a bit of asthma on top of that that's sort of Makes him wheeze a bit when he talks, so it'll be <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, have a ball still kicking, so he's okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, as a as a bodybuilder, he had like a, a freaky yeah, physique yeah, he and real freaky, huge upper body, huge for you know, even for a black guy, you know, huge quads, huge calves, because a lot of black guys were never really good in the calf department. But he had he was like good all over, and for a big guy, he had a tiny waist, so which you don't really see these days at all. And how do you reckon you'd go today? Paul, I reckon he'd still do well. He'd still win shows today if he was around. To me, Paul around his best today is better than Phil Heath. So if Paul yeah. was around at his best today, coming in good condition, he looks better than Phil Heath and those guys. So easy. Any of those guys now, I reckon, Kevin Leverone his best, Paul DeLed his best, Chris Cormier at his best, Flex Wheeler at his best. All those guys would, you know, sorry to say, would beat the Phil Heath, Branch Warrens and all those guys of today. Simple as that, so. And what about training? You, you, I've heard stories he was a lazy trainer, but it's, yeah, is that you know, true? Occasionally he'd go here, but occasionally you know, Paul had his own way of training, very, like I said, I guess it worked for him, because I guess he just had the genetics for, you know, one of those guys can just touch a weight and grow, so. Yeah, sometimes you wouldn't see him go super all out, Paul. he will just do his thing <laughs> and then wander off, so. <laughs> he wasn't really into the going crazy balls that are all killing himself type heavy training like the Dorian style, so, no. <laughs> so he really did have great genetics. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's what people see him now, like, oh, look at him now, it's all drugs. But, you know, Paul doesn't lift weights anymore. He doesn't eat like he used to yeah. He doesn't take drugs like he used to take. So it's only natural. Your body's just going to mus muscle atrophies if you're not using it. So I'm sure if Paul was to train naturally, he'd still look great, but he's just not interested in doing that anymore, so people say what they want but you know i'm sure if you want to get back into it he'll look great again so i've seen some pictures of mike christian he started training again and he's looking really good so you know mike i remember used to be one of those guys who would take months off after a show but as soon as he started training and eating mm. properly and stuff like that he just grew again so you know i said the guys that have the genetics are always going to have it so yeah you always just get these naysayers and like like i said you know when kevin stopped and you know people like dorian stop and they come off water gear they stop eating they stop training they're like Ah, oh, look at him, it was just all drugs. It's like, no, it wasn't. And I said, 
Dorian or any of those guys, if they were just to eat six, seven meals a day and train hard, they'd still look good. But you know, like I said, as life goes on, your mindset changes and you're not going to beat yourself up like that anymore to look that way. If you don't have to look that way, why worry about it? Just stay healthy and do the best you can. Yeah, and also I can understand why some bodybuilders finish their competitive career and go, oh, look, the last thing I want to do is see inside a gym or, you know, I want well, to... That's yeah. the, sadly the ones that normally end up dying are the ones who aren't really the pros, half of them. It's always the amateur guys who want to be pro and they give up competing, but yet they got that in their mind and everyone looks small, so they give up competing, but yet through the whole life they still abuse drugs, they still eat all the food, they still train, and just like I said, just constantly push their body. They're the ones that end up killing themselves because they just keep abusing the drugs, thinking that they want to be small, they can't handle being like a normal person. So, like I said, they're the ones that end up, like I said, at the other end, that end up fucking dying and doing something to themselves, so. Yeah. All those other guys, like I said, Paul, Kevin, they got nothing to prove, you know, they've been at the yeah. top, they've won pro shows, they've been legends of the sport, champions of the sport, they got nothing to prove, so. You know, they're happy, so I don't know why those other people have to have their say about them and talk shit. The ones that, like I said, the ones that have done nothing are the ones that are talking the shit all the time, so. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, bodybuilders, they can't, they can't retire, they can't, um... Exactly. You're cursed for life. <laughs> <laughs>